everybody, and welcome to another episode of Cartoon Clearance with Meg and Dan. I'm Meg. And I'm Dan. And today, despite the fact that it's a couple months late, we're going back to school. We've done our shopping, we've gotten our extra sets of ramble pants all polished up. Our number two pencils. And our number two pencils. Because today we will be discussing a certain show called Clone High. Daniel, would you like to tell us a little bit about Clone High's background? Sure. Without my number two pencil, I'll try. So, Clone High was created by Phil Lord and Chris Miller, a writing duo who have worked on the Lego movie, 21 Jump Street, 22, 21 Jump Street sequel, I don't know what it's called, I never saw those movies, <laughs> and Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. They came up with the show's concept while they were attending Dartmouth College back in the 90s. So they pitched this idea to Fox. It was rejected, but it was picked up by MTV in the early 2000s, 2003. According to Lord and Miller, the show was meant to be a parody of teen dramas, and they prepared for the writing process by watching all of Dawson's Creek and other shows like it. The show had 13 episodes, which aired throughout 2003, and it features the voice talents of Will Forte, Nicole Sullivan, Michael McDonald, Miller and Lord, respectively, uh, Krista Miller and a cacophony of special guest appearances like Andy Dick, Marilyn Manson, and Jack Black. (laughs) Uh, Reviews for the show were mixed initially. Some people found the show to be a nice change of pace from other animated content on MTV and subsequently television, while others found its humor to be a little bit lacking and the character direction was not as focused as it could have been. Though some people also praised that for some reason, though we'll discuss that later. Controversy sprang up around the show because a article, I believe a Maxim magazine, depicted one of the episode's uh, stills of Gandhi, Gandhi's one of the characters in the show, being beaten up by JFK, another character in the show, and this was not cool in India. I think they were just celebrating like the assassination date, or maybe not celebrating it, revering it might be the more appropriate thing to say. Bad timing. Yeah, bad timing. So India like flipped out about gandhi being depicted this way and they they start going on hunger strikes they swarm the mtv branch building they like demanded that clone high be taken off the air or they were going to revoke mtv's license certificate to air programs so mtv went back to lord and miller and asked them to pitch a new season of clone high without gandhi they tried but mtv i think was just too focused on the controversy and the show was canceled with only one season Meg, would you like to give us a little bit of a summary about Clone High? Well, it all begins way, way back in the 1980s. Secret government employees dug up famous guys and ladies and made amusing genetic copies. Now the clones are sexy teens now. All right, okay, I'm I'm not going to quote the whole theme song. I guess that's a little bit cheating. As the lyrics indicate, Clone High is a school whose student body is made up of the clones of various historical figures, such as our main protagonists, who are the clones of Abraham Lincoln, Joan of Arc, and Gandhi. And the clones are being raised for some nefarious purpose that's never really elaborated on and never really affects their lives. They have a maniacal principal named Scudworth who wants to betray... Cinnamon J. Scudworth. Cinnamon? Oh, that's his... Really? That's his first name. It flashes by really quick in the (laughs) opening. (laughs) That's beautiful. I love it. So, Cinnamon J. Scudworth is their maniacal principal who wants to betray his shady government bosses and make, I guess, an amusement park that's a zoo featuring the clones. But that also doesn't really affect the clones at all because he never really gets anywhere with that. So... What do they do? Their days are mostly spent navigating the dangerous waters of high school and all the stereotypical emotional baggage that entails, aka romance. That's the the biggest focus of this show. So you've got this big love dodecahedron, I guess, (laughs) where you have the cynical Joan of Arc who's desperately pining away for oblivious Abe, who is single-mindedly pursuing the queen bee Cleopatra, who's on and off dating the heartthrob, jock, tight-bunned JFK, and Gandhi does Gandhi things, like publicly humiliating his depressed classmates who reached out to him in a vulnerable time. You know, the usual. I, I think <laughs> I think the Indians probably had a lot more to be offended about than just him getting beaten up, but, I mean, it's a parody, so I guess 
there's a degree of things that are excusable. I'm not really the best person to judge on that. But anyway, we can get into that. What did you think of the show, Daniel? So anytime I talk about any show that I, I, I bring up, I like to do a little sort of background to how I came about it. And Clone High was actually a show that I never watched when it was on TV or growing up. I remember my older brother and his friends, though, talking about it. And the, for the longest time, I think the only thing I really knew about the show was this one clip of JFK trying to teach elocution to uh, Gandhi, like the <laughs> Pygmalion. And he's like, Foa Sapa, I yeah, uh, would like to order the party platter. And I remember everyone <laughs> quoting that. And honestly, I really My Fair that. Lady. I thought about this show and it's all about historical figures. Abraham Lincoln's the main character. It should be like the perfect show for me. As the history Unfortunately, book. I think it was only chuckle worthy for me. Uh, the, the, I think the areas that I enjoyed the most was probably the art. Uh, the the delivery of certain jokes some jokes were really funny certain characters were very great even though they were only in it for like three seconds <laughs> but overall i think the show it fell flat but i'll start with the positives so like i said art music's good yeah certain characters stand out to me like i said before jfk say even though he's like the dumb idiot character he's a pretty good dumb idiot meg's favorite mr butlertron oh yeah I like the angry cop that's played by Andy Dick, uh, Joan of Arc's step foster father, the blind foster clarinet jazz musician Toots, Toots. Uh, George Washington Carver's genetically mutated peanut. Like, there's a lot of like really funny, like they're all clones, so of course they have this, but then some of them are just like George Washington Carver, who who in turn genetically engineered a new peanut thing. It's weird, right? But uh, honestly, that's uh, the show falls flat in a lot of other areas that could have made it uh, really funny and just entertaining all around yeah i i wasn't all that impressed i had actually seen the first episode of this some time ago probably um just a few months ago so not that long ago and there was kind of a reason i never really watched beyond that because the first episode while it had some funny aspects to it didn't really do it for me there's a lot of really obnoxious humor like i said before gandhi's character is just so obnoxious and there's nothing likable about him at all and honestly there's nothing really likable about a lot of the characters like our protagonists abe lincoln joan of arc gandhi none of them have anything that really made me sympathize with them because it was all just crass jokes or pining and or being like stupidly oblivious to things to the point yeah. where it makes you a jerk. I think for me the show suffered for the same reasons that Mission Hill suffered for me was because the characters were complete shallow jerkwads that had very few redeeming qualities if they had them at all. So the constant stream of hit and miss jokes isn't enough to make up for that lack of substance for me. I think that if they were going for a parody, that shallowness could be excused, but I kind of feel like they played it a little bit too straight for it to really come off that way. Like, you know, right from the first episode, you see that Joan is pining over Abe, but Abe likes the nasty popular girl. And you go, okay, by the end of this, Abe is going to be about to get the girl and then realize that he really has feelings for Joan. But, yeah, and you're like, oh, that's really cliche. I'm hoping a show that's trying to be this edgy or fresh wouldn't do that. And it does exactly that. Yeah, it does exactly that. And so I, I feel like, you know, Cleopatra reciprocates Abe's feelings for whatever reason. That's never explained, never even hinted at why she likes him when she's still kind of like maybe going off with JFK behind his back once in a while. Yeah, yeah. I think the problem is that like you said the show is a parody and normally i mean I, I like a lot of spoofs one of my favorites mel brooks comedies or wet hot american summer which has caught on a lot in the past couple of years those are movies and shows that also have very shallow characters i'm okay with the show having shallow characters oh yeah but the thing is that like you should play up to that without being too terrible uh, to compare it to wet hot american summer so you have the abraham in in clone high you have abraham lincoln and cleopatra 
are, are wanting to be a couple and the whole thing oh joan actually likes abraham lincoln there's gonna be a love triangle quadrangle whatever you want to call it okay but it's so frustrating because abraham lincoln's obliviousness is just played off as jokes even when joan in many episodes just straight up says i like you and he's like to you would like me to help you out with this thing yeah it's like you would like me to help you with a makeover it's like it's just like the the jokes aren't funny so all you're left with is a character that's just a jerk whereas the example i like to use in wet hot american summer is spoiler alert just go put that out there at the end of the movie you have a very similar thing where the main character wants to get the girl but the girl's dating a jerk the jerk is dumped and then the girl's like I, I i love you i want to be with you and then the and then the next day the main character is like talking about what they're going to do now that they're a couple and then the girl just completely backtracks is just like you know what i think you're a great guy but i'm 18 years old there's only one thing I want to do, and that's screwing. <laughs> my boyfriend was really good at that, and he's, like, hot. But you're a nice guy. But see ya. And, like, that is, like, the perfect, like, pull the rug out from under you. The characters are all shallow, but it's still, like, a, a good comedic kind of shallow. And this, like, in Clone High just doesn't come off that way, especially when the jokes fall flat. They're all gags. Right. Like, I think the fact that Cleopatra ends up reciprocating Abe for whatever reason kind of messes up that parodical yeah. thing because at points her feelings seem to be really genuine, but from what we know about her character, which is pretty much that she's shallow, she likes um, she likes power, she likes being the top of the top, it doesn't really make sense as to why she would really reciprocate other than... Yeah, what does she get out yeah, of this relationship? Because Abe isn't high up on the, on the social ladder. He's not really anything that she wants. What she wants is JFK, and they're constantly fighting and breaking up, but that's just part of their, like, parody dynamic. Like, we don't really get along, but we keep coming back together anyway because you're hot and because yeah, we're yeah. both popular. But Abe is not really either of those things. So why does she like him? We don't know. And then there's really no development of that. And I feel like if you're going to make her genuinely like him back, there needs to be some kind of development. Actual, yeah, actual emotional bearing yeah. in the whole relationship. And I think one of the big areas that this show failed in its setup of that is that I think Abraham Lincoln, clone Abraham Lincoln, uh, <laughs> gets the girl too quick. He gets Cleopatra in like episode maybe two or three. three two or three. And that's an interesting route to take, but what's the buildup? The buildup is that Abe wants to, like, have sex with Cleo, I guess. But not really at the same time. Like, his the buildup is that can Abe keep Cleo yeah. before he realizes that he actually likes Joan. And that's kind of a... There's no development to him realizing that he likes Joan either. Like, you would yeah. think that they would drop hints throughout the show... But it's constantly, and I guess you could say that his consistent and very, very persistent denial of her feelings is maybe a hint in and of itself. But it's not played off the right way. It's, I, I don't think it's enough. And I know we've talked about, when, when we've been discussing this personally before recording, we've We've ended up comparing the dynamic of, these, of, of this trio of protagonists to the ones in Danny Phantom a lot. Yeah. Because they have a really similar dynamic. You have the main character who's in love with the popular girl, his female friend who's got a crush on him, and then the third friend who's like... A third wheel, pretty much. <laughs> you know, comic relief, that kind of thing. But Danny and Sam actually do have development. They actually have a friendship to base off of, and you can see their feelings kind of surfacing and getting buried down again as the show kind of progresses and when i watched that show i actually really liked them as a couple which is surprising for me but like joan and abe's interactions are entirely either joan giving abe advice or getting her ear talked off about his relationship with cleo or abe completely steamrolling over all of her attempts at romantic advances and, and you know what actually i'm thinking about now is that I want to know why Joan likes Abe. Exactly, like... Do they ever actually put in little seeds? Like, at one point in the show, Cleo and Joan are... They become roommates. And 
they have a sort of weird heart to heart moment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that substantial, but whatever. It's not that lasting either. Yeah, I thought, why don't you take advantage of that opportunity where you just moved two characters into the same house who hate each other mm -hmm. and where you could have an actual heart to heart? She's living with the person who is dating the person she loves. Yeah. That sounds like at some point something would come up and cleo knows that too oh yeah and it, it that should play into her character or something and it could still all be funny but it's just a lot of like lost so much because they never really did anything with that scenario aside from use it to have a couple of cat fights yeah and to move on to another issue i think that one of the things that i felt was a big letdown was that the clones didn't seem to recognize that they were clones sometimes like they all called each other oh hey clone jfk or clone blah 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 but there wasn't any like sort of pressure to live up to their clone standard usually it was a it was for a joke and sometimes you know i, I laughed like jfk is in a car and he just looked behind him and he's just like nothing bad ever happens to the kennedys <laughs> and he drives away and then it's like okay that's pretty funny in a very dark way but but, like, yeah, like, they do that, and then maybe once or twice, Abe will be like, what would the real Abraham Lincoln do? But it's not something that the, all the clones sort of think about. There's a couple, like, points where they do, but it's lost. Like, it's never a thing that all the clones, like, think about the fact that they were, they're not originals. Yeah, definitely. They're living under the shadow of these other clones. And maybe it's because the focus of the show, it was an excuse to get all these historical figures into the same school. Right. And, and it's okay that way, but I think it would have been very interesting, especially since they played with it in some episodes, to have this sort of, like, either insecurity or over bravado -ness about being the clone of Abraham Lincoln or being the clone of Cleopatra. Right. And, you know, they did mention a couple of times, oh... I'm this way because of the pressure of being expected to live up to such and such historical figure. Like Joan of Arc was like, oh, I'm really cynical as kind of like an opposite reaction to how I'm quote unquote supposed to be. Or Gandhi, who's just like, no, I'm going crazy. Like, I can't do that peace stuff. Yeah. Um, you have an episode where Joan thinks that God is talking to her, but really it's just like the local Christian rock station getting picked up on her retainer. And there's one episode towards the end where Abe is like having this whole emotional crisis of like, I'm not good at conflict resolution. What am I supposed to do? But it's really never important. The fact that they're clones is never really important either to the characters Aside from a few throwaway lines that just seems kind of like a lazy excuse or just a couple of plot points. And, you know, you would think that the fact that they were clones being raised for some specific purpose by some shady government organization would have some kind of bearing on their lives. But they're just kind of going about high school. I think in one episode, maybe the government guy said something about wanting like an army but there is nothing to indicate that ever the quote-unquote antagonists almost never interact at all with the clones. There's maybe three or four occasions where they're even interacting with the principal. So it, it seems like there's not really much of a point to it. Yeah, and I think that because the jokes are very 50-50, I don't remember an episode as a whole. I don't remember an episode from start to finish like other shows that we've watched. Like I could be like, oh, episode seven. That's when blah, blah, blah happened. I, I can't name you. I can only name the gags and maybe some of like, I'm like, okay, I think this episode had Jack Black as a special guest. Definitely. But I couldn't really tell you everything that happened. It's very like moment based. So in a way, you know, if you want to watch Clone High, go ahead and watch Clone High. But I think it would have worked well as like, five minute snippets right because it would have been just for the joke it could still be the parody of the high school drama but you don't have to worry about treating it as such because i think the main problem is that it lacked heart and we've talked about that I think yeah that nauseum by now but it really is like don't try to inject your show with heart when you've been building these characters up to be heartless 
Right. Like, it's not going to be like an, oh, it's an epiphany moment. It's like, this is just underdeveloped. Like, I think the, I think you pointed out to me when Abe realizes he loves Joan, it's because Joan dressed up like a quote slut. Yeah. And he's like, and Whoa, something wait, that Joan she is herself hot. is completely and 100% uncomfortable with and not happy with. Definitely my favorite parts of the show were the characters that actually did have part in some sh way, shape, or form. Like, it's funny because I, I liked the characters who were arguably the antagonists over the protagonists, you know, very ineffectual antagonists, but you had Principal Scudworth, who's basically like a much less nasty version of Mr. Crocker from Fairly Odd Parents, because he's just so kooky and off in his own world and like off on these ridiculous schemes with his faithful little robot butler who's just a little robot butler in a cardigan sweater who like goes and consoles the students when they're emotionally down and encourages the principal and is his constant companion like they actually have a friendship that was interesting for me to watch i loved their scenes because they were actually funny they had a kind of charm to them because of the fact that they were just, I don't know, they seemed like actual... They, well, they had a give-and-take relationship is what it was. You had episodes where Mr. Butlertron was being overshadowed. Most of the time, that's what it was coming from. He was being overshadowed yeah, by yeah. the SAT prep machine. Right, and then ultimately Scudworth comes to the realization that, oh no, I actually do need and rely on my little robot butler, and we have this actual friendship going on here. It was really good to watch. And then um, Joan's foster grandfather, Toots, was so, like, he was Toots so is funny. Amazing. And it was, I think it was funny because his silliness was coming from a place of caring, you know? Not that, not that all humor has to be about, like, caring and whatnot, but. No, but, like, it lampoons it. Like, the first time you see Toots, he. It's during a parent-teacher conference where everyone's, like, outraged that Gandhi has ADD and ADHD. And then Toots just stands up, and you think he's going to be the voice of reason. He's like, now I may be a blind man, but I can see y'all are angry. Which tells me this is not the sizzler that I thought I was in. Now, if you excuse me, I'm going to go get lobster. Carry on with your parent-teacher conference. It's like, yeah. it's a perfect, like, I gotcha. Like, to Toots is like, and as, I mean, like... I live with a blind person. So I think a lot of the blind jokes came off as very, like, definitely you know, <laughs> hyperbole, but very true. Like, you know, you have a scene of Toots being like, Storms of Bruin, <laughs> yeah. in front of, like, an open refrigerator. Or, like, it's just like, The flood's coming. Get in the boat, Jonah. And there's, like, land. no water, but he's, like, rowing a boat. For me, they were great. And Toots was actually, like, he still was a voice of reason, but in a very funny, cartoony way. Like, now, Jonah. You're my daughter, and I love you, and you're so beautiful. And he touches a basketball. He's like, "Oh, Joni, <laughs> you're gonna want to work on that." <laughs> like, you know, it, it, he was still a gag character, but he had a little bit of like good-natured warmth yeah. to him at the same time. Yeah, it was fun. He was a fun character. I'd say like the only other episode that I really like enjoyed that I would say is my favorite is when jfk's best friend who is just introduced what are you talking about he was totally an important main clone in the entire series i will i will admit they, there is some funny like setups to clone high like how the announcer there's a narrator and he always sets up this is a very special episode of clone high every episode is a very special episode and one episode like they tease it's like next episode it's one of the clones who you've definitely known for the whole series is going to die which is and then they flash on screen a character you've never seen before and it ends up being that character obviously but it's like instead of the fawns it's the pawns as ponce de leon and he just wears a leather <laughs> jacket but like fancy purple pants and it's jfk's best friend and he dies from litter and like <laughs> a horrible graphic death Oh, it was well, like, so He's, gruesome. like, gurgling on blood that's, like, being pooled in a bag that's wrapped around his head. And he, cr he went the way of the sea turtle. But, like, yeah. But, like, everything, like, in that episode was actually, like, kind of funny. Like, JFK actually showed that he wasn't such a huge jerk and he actually cared about something other than himself. Yeah. It was somewhat interesting. Cleo actually shows she sort of has heart because she still considers JFK to be her friend. And Abe has to go down and comfort jfk mostly to get his girlfriend back <laughs> but also like 
because he sees that JFK is not a huge jerk. And JFK, while still in shambles, manages to be a funny character. Like, the ghost of the ponds comes back, and he's like, are you a genie? He lives inside my head. <laughs> He, like, rubs his forehead. I think we were talking about JFK being the best example of a parody character done actually right. Yeah, absolutely. I th because he was so over the top. Like, he was so over the top, but then he still had that kind of... I think because JFK is a, is a historical figure that is still very much celebrated, lambasted, whatever you want to call it, he's a person that everyone knows, and he's... There's a lot of stuff you can parody about it because he's so famous, not just for being the president, but being a part of the Kennedy legacy and everything. Right. That you could be like, yeah, what if, uh, like, the greatest, no, not the greatest president of the 20th century, but one of the most well known presidents of the 20th century, you just make him a huge tool. <laughs> so, and that's why I think, in conclusion, if we may conclude, oh, yes. the show had so much potential to be, as I said when I started, the show should have been my favorite show with all the makings. I love the style. I love some of the jokes the the whole concept of all these historical figures being in a high school together makes me laugh so much i love i love shows set in schools i don't like teen drama stuff but i like stuff that's set in schools yeah i think if you gave me a show about principal scudworth and mr b and had guest appearances by like jfk and toots i i, I could do without most of the rest yeah so i think that's gonna do it i think this so episode of cartoon clearance yeah. if you thought what we said was good and commendable leave a commendable comment and maybe like and if you really like us i'm not pressuring you i'm not peer pressuring you into anything because i watched an episode about that on clone high but subscribe if you like us we are discount ramble pants and remember when god gives you lemons you clone those lemons and make super lemons this ends a very special episode of Cartoon Clearance. We'd better see you next time. Bye.